Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Chatting with Creators. My name is Nathaniel Bryant, currently subbing in for Sapphire Toth, who was the previous host as she works on a feature film this summer. Uh, a little bit about myself, for those of you that don't know, I am currently a senior at Berklee School of Music. My major is film scoring. Um, and today on the podcast, we have a very special guest, Jeff Cardoni, who is here talking about his latest project. Uh, I believe it is out now on HBO Max. Uh, called White House Plumbers. Um, so, Jeff, if you'd like to begin by just like telling us a little bit about the the show and what kind of approach you took to the music of the show. I watched the first episode last night. It was really great. Big fan of the music. It gets better. Yeah. <laughs> nice. It's, uh... <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's obviously another take on the whole Watergate story, which we, you know, everyone's heard a million times. So mm -hmm. it was, it was just a different approach. And the, the director and showrunner is Dave Mandel from Veep, so he kind of has that kind of quirky perspective. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know, for me, it was like to to incorporate all the touchstones of like all the '70s thrillers, you know, like in all the President's Men and all, the, you know. David Shire, Lalo Schiffer, and all, all like stuff that I thought of from the period, all the piano scores, all the jazzy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but also to make it modern. And, and also, you know, the big thing about this for me, the, the hard thing was it kind of changes tonally as the show goes on. Like they don't, they don't get into, I didn't know, that, you know, they tried four times to actually complete the break-in. Mm -hmm. So they were kind of bumped around for the first until the third episode till they actually get in yeah, yeah so you know there's first scene is you know you think they're going to get in so it's super serious and all stringy in 70s and, and tension and then they don't get in and it's kind of you know you pull the rug out and it's like oh okay we have to we got to go back a little bit in time in intensity to get you to the actual break-in but then after mm -hmm. the break-in in three it's drama and you know people in jail people dying people yeah, throwing their yeah. lives away so totally to kind of make that all feel like the same movie I, you know i basically just approach it like a five-hour movie but to yeah yeah to thread that needle was was hard you know because some projects it's either all dark right from the start or it's all funny for you know and this was it had to kind of thread the needle and even though I never wanted the music to be funny, and I personally tried to never have it be funny. But yeah. you know, some of the dialogue was hysterical, you know, so you you got to kind of go with it. So mm -hmm. it was that was the hardest thing for me. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think it's after hearing the music in the first episode and kind of listening to the score on Spotify, I can definitely see that there's a progression as it goes on. It's interesting what you said about the the five hour movie approach as well, because I've been seeing a lot of shows nowadays be approached with that scoring method and seeing people talk about it. It seems like that's a better way to approach, especially this kind of TV show where it's like all laid out in longer episodes, but a shorter amount of time, if that makes sense. Oh yeah. It's, I mean, creatively it's way more enjoyable to, mm -hmm. to approach this long form, you know, I mean, cause you, you know, inherently it, if you're doing something episodic, there there are certain things that you sometimes have to do that just you don't, as a composer, you don't like to do. You don't like going to commercials. You don't like, you know, having to play out at the end or play mm -hmm. in at the end. You know, there's some like functional things that are really annoying to do if you're doing something episodic that's got to be broken yeah. up, and especially if there's commercials. I mean, so this is nice where you don't think about any of that and you just yeah. really a five-hour movie and so even thematically you can think of things in a different way you can develop things over a longer period of time and mm -hmm. you're not trying to have a beginning middle of an end of every episode it's more yeah. we're all tied together and so i enjoy working that way 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 more you know yeah it's yeah, nice i mean it, it, yeah and it's nice having you know there's an end you know mm -hmm. what i mean like you know it's there's not a cliffhanger going to the next yeah season. yeah there's no way there's gonna be another season of this so mm -hmm. that's kind of fun to to know where it's gonna end yeah absolutely it's not like you're waiting to get greenlit for season four or season yeah. five and you're not sure like if it's gonna be resolved yeah i mean because unfortunately sometimes you get stuck in those things and they don't get resolved you yeah know? And yeah I, I did this one show for nine seasons of csi miami and it got canceled and there was no ending. There was no, you know, there's no resolution. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of a drag when you don't get a chance to end it, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this was the opposite. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you mentioned just now about how you didn't want the music to feel comedic. Um, yep. That's a really interesting point because I noticed that in a lot of the scenes, the score in the crypt or the score in the script together seemed to work to benefit towards the comedic timing of the scene. Even if you weren't trying to make the music sound comedic, was comedic timing something that you had in mind? Because I can imagine how difficult comedic timing is, like one in writing, but to be able to communicate that through music at the same time seems like an interesting challenge to get over. Yeah, I mean, I think so much of comedy is timing, you know, mm -hmm. more than the content of the music itself. It's where it comes in, where it, go, where it goes out. Yeah, where it goes yeah. Out. So much of that has so much to do with with comedy and it, to a point where it, it can drive you crazy because it's it's so specific sometimes, which I, you know, I don't personally like to be. I like to think of more like the big picture, the more the the emotion, the the thought than the you know mickey mousing of specific things you know yeah. but that that's so so for me comedy is is rhythm and it's and it's it's also figuring out some type of groove whether that's literally a groove or so just what the instrumentation what's the walking around sound of this of this project you know? yeah yeah it's getting them from a to b you know because mm -hmm. so much of that a lot of times is rhythm or something with pace yeah you always hear people talking about pace um so yeah, it's it's a thing, and, and honestly, in the first episode, um, there were a lot of cues that I fought to drop, and we we did end up dropping a lot of them because I felt like you know the dialogue is hysterical, yeah. and I feel like it's better without music ruining it. So, mm -hmm. You know, so there were probably five or six cues in the first episode that were a little short, and I felt like they were just a little tedious, you know. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, it doesn't need this. Let's leave leave it go without music, and I, yeah. I think it's better, yeah. better for that, you know. It seems like you approached a lot of the cues, like you said before, as like a movie technique rather than like a TV show, trying to like avoid that cliche. Oh, yes, desperately. Trying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's why as it went further and further, it got so much more. I, I felt like it got its footing. You know, the first episode is always hard. And this, this yeah. project, especially like this, they were on post on this for like a year and a half or something before I came in. Like they were... And sometimes when you get that microscopic on stuff, you kind of lose the big picture a little bit. So, mm -hmm. so I think there was a lot of second guessing in the first episode as far as what it needs, where it's going, what it, what's it going to be. Yeah and, yeah. and so that's, you know, that's a process. And it's also just to, to, with the filmmakers to kind of get them just looking at it with fresh eyes sometimes. And that's hard, yeah. you know, Again, like we come in and we're, we're given a different approach and we're, we don't know the history, but mm -hmm. you know, someone else knows every piece of temp music they tried there, everything they talked about, everything that didn't work. And so there's always just like that baggage. So every conversation, while we think we're talking about this one thing, it's, there's so much stuff in the past that got uh -huh. to this conversation. So, yeah. You know, so I, I feel like after the pilot, then we really started finding our footing and we weren't, there was no looking back or there was no second guessing. And that, mm -hmm. that was, to Dave's credit, he really did, he really did kind of buy in once we, once we got going. Um, but like the, the first, the first cue in the, it was not that hard because it was a little more, you kind of knew what you were doing with that, except yeah. for when they didn't get in that. What ended up being the main titles. That was literally the first thing I wrote, and that ended oh, wow. up sticking through the whole process. Nice, yeah. But there was a cue right after that, yeah, when um it was in Hunt's office, and he was kind of down and out. And there's some like sad music, a little introspective, and I, I didn't think it needed music there, and I fought to not have that because I didn't I I didn't, but I lost that fight. So I'm glad we kept pulling it back and toning it back till there's not much there. So I don't think it's as offensive as I thought originally. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, that's cool. Um, and would you say, how did you say you nailed the transition between kind of that more lighthearted after the first attempt, it kind of fizzles out a little bit, but after that third attempt, everything starts to get more serious. How did you compositionally get that gradient to be consistent enough so that it's not noticeable as the tone shifts? Um, I think to let the, the what we're seeing on screen kind of lead a little bit and not try to get in front of it with the music. Mm -hmm. um, that was one thing. And also to um, have thematic 
nugget. So like pre pretty much every cue, there's there's a couple of little motifs. There's a motif for Hunt and, and Liddy, which is the main titles. And then there's one for the family. There's one for Liddy. The first time you see him, there's like this bass groove with terminal guitar. There are all these like little two bar phrases, but I found like using them a lot because yeah, I, I think as composers, sometimes we think like in our head, we're like, oh, we know this little tune, you know, we know, we know our theme. Yeah. Uh, and you worry about using it too much. But I think for people to get something, you got to, you got to use it a lot. And hit yeah, you just got to get so that like, in. Yeah. I don't think there was any cue that didn't have one of those little motifs in it in some way, because I think if you don't get that, get it in their head, then it doesn't make any sense. So, so yeah. Thematically, it was another way I tried to tie it through. So like, and, and then instrumentation wise, like, so, you know, for the first three and a half episodes, it was more of like, uh, you know, Wurlitzer and Clavinet and Rhodes and like smaller ensemble stuff, flute, uh, like some drum set and uh, the strings, we had a string orchestra, but it was small for the first half, it was 15 people and two horns. And then as it got heavier, after episode three, we had 55 strings and four horns. So like nice. trying to like build the density of the instrumentation as it went on, you know what I mean? Yeah, like that's, yeah. That was another thing I tried to do where it was a little late in the beginning mm -hmm. and then it got heavier and the percussion got a little more distorted and the orchestra got bigger. So there's just more weight to all yeah. the, as it, as it went on. That, mm -hmm. And that was another way I tried to help with that. Interesting. Yeah. I think instrumentalist density is a really smart way to kind of achieve that transition just like slowly adding more and more and that's not really yeah, I don't think that's I, something people think about either you know i i personally have never thought about that before yeah. you know like, uh you know sometimes like yeah by the end of the movie sometimes it's bigger but this was mm -hmm. like i never thought about literally doing it that way and it was kind of a cool experiment especially nice. with percussion too where it was like more clean in the beginning and then i like the bass drum i put through a distortion pedal after Ooh. the episode to kind of just put more weight and more yeah. heaviness and more, yeah. more discordant sound as it went on. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. And that was that was cool too. That was a kind nice. of fun. Discovery. Yeah. Um how much of the score would you say is like a new experiment for you, like you just mentioned? Like how much of it was stuff that you were familiar with, stuff that you had kind of like your bread and butter, and how much of it was let's just try this new thing, see how it goes. I mean, for me, a lot of it was new because I hadn't really done a period piece set in this mm -hmm. period. You know, I mean, I am familiar with I, I thought about David Shire very much and a lot of his piano scores and all, a lot of his scores from that period. So when I was like demoing, trying to get the job, like I knew I, I thought like harmonically, a lot of that more jazzy harmony and a little thicker harmony was kind of what I wanted to try to do. And that was mm -hmm. kind of in my original demos. And that's not something you get to do a lot of times unless you're in yeah. like a specific time period or doing some kind of something really specific. So that was that was a kind of a fun experiment. You know, I mean, honestly, some of the chordal stuff, it was literally just keep piling on notes to, and make it just sound a little not of now, you know. Mm -hmm. So that that was kind of fun to, to be able to kind of mess around in that playground a little bit, a little jazzier. Nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The flute stuff, even the flute in the main title, like I had worked with this guy, Katice Buckingham, before, who's he's he's amazing. He his his claim to fame was he played on Anchorman, you know, in Will Ferrell. Oh yeah. 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 Oh, so that's that's Katice. So like I've used him for years and he's so good. And like so I I knew even like the there's the last phrase in the main title, it's this kind of little jazzy. Da -da 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 -da. I, I knew he was gonna play that. So like <laughs> I wrote it specifically knowing in my head that he was gonna do it. Nice, so, yeah. So, so that's kind of fun, you know, and just, you know, kind of this combination of instruments is fun to do. I mean, you can't can't really say it's new because it's it's been done from that time period. But for me, it was it was new. And mm -hmm. so it was fun. Yeah, that's cool. You had a it seems so many like there's so much like Oceans and Bartowski, you know, a lot of these like espionage movies from when I was a kid, you know, it's great because I feel like there's it's been a couple years since a period piece like that or something that has that thematic idea like has been released so it was cool to see that in a newer more modern presentation you know right hey that's all i can ask for you know yeah, I'll, take, yeah. I'll take that compliment you know because <laughs> it no it's rare i mean david said he wanted a modern 70s thriller that was his thing you know mm -hmm. and yeah. and 
I mean, honestly, anytime there's anytime you get some kind of groove going, so it's, you know, to make it modern, sometimes it's some of the drum grooves are a little more mm -hmm. chopped up and loopy, just yeah. because that I feel like that's what. But then if you do that, you're going to get compared to Ocean's Eleven, no matter yeah. what. You know? <laughs> so you know, episode eight about Ocean's Eleven, and you know, screw it, it is what it is. You yeah, know? I, yeah, and whatever. Yeah, I mean, you can't get away from that, and it's, whatever, it's great. So yeah, that's uh, fair. I didn't consciously. Yeah, I read a review, and it's like, yeah, it's like, yeah I guess and, uh, sometimes yeah. you can't avoid comparisons. I didn't sample any of it; it was played. It was all exactly real yeah. playing and stuff. As long so, as it's all original, then whatever you're all set up. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, yeah, I mean, is anything all original anyway? It's like exactly, yeah. yeah. Like how mm -hmm. much of Star Wars mm -hmm. was already written by the Holtz? That whole argument, you know. Um, Everyone, everyone's a critic, but you know inside <laughs> when, you, when you make something, you know if you're doing it from something you came up with, what whatever your influences are, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah. you know if you're sitting there trying to ape something or you're not, and you know, and I I know I wasn't trying to ape anything, you know, and so there it is. That's all Even, you can do, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're all the sum of our influences and what inspires mm -hmm. us, and that's everyone is. That's yeah. Fine. Even so, I think the the score was implemented in a very interesting way from a modern lens. Like I wasn't listening to it saying like, Oh, this is just oceans. It was like reminiscent, right. but so much of it was still like, Oh yeah, this is the year or not in the right. show. This is currently the year 2023. That's when this music was composed for this seventies period piece. You right. know? So that was cool to yeah, see. That's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting to get into time periods. Yeah. Cause I mean, everything you're looking at is so production design of you know is so authentic so mm -hmm. if you start playing with the time period with the music it's kind of interesting or or wrong or yeah <laughs> but yeah i wasn't specifically i didn't care you know I mean, whatever there yeah um you had mentioned before about like little increments of different motifs and themes what drove you to choose some of those specific themes like how did you get that melody to come together whether it be for like jeff and liddy or for hunt or for various other characters it was really just the beginning sitting down and trying to come up with them first it's just those building blocks you know, david yeah. wanted to hear themes um so it was literally just sitting at the piano in here with with three guys on the couch uh greg feinberg and Lana motto from hbo and, and, mm -hmm. and they were just sitting here and, and listening to things and I and yeah, it was literally that. You know, it was it was I couldn't start on anything until they liked some of the melodies, which yeah, you know, yeah. sometimes doesn't happen these days, but it was it mm -hmm. was it was fun. You know, and some of them were discoveries. I might have had like a 16 bar thing and like bar 14 they heard like a little snippet that mm -hmm. they liked. And that's that honestly, that's how the mean title thing a little chromatic. Uh -huh. That was yeah, that was like the B side one of the things I did, and they liked that. And so but nice. yeah, I, I find like it, to to start writing before you have your like building blocks is just then you're just at the computer making stuff that sounds good so mm -hmm. for me i always like to i just use my iphone i sit at the piano and just have all these little snippets and to, yeah to me you got to have your your music before you start writing to picture mm -hmm. or else because I, I find that it's too easy to make stuff that sounds good if you sit at the computer and they're trying to you know what i mean like yeah yeah easy to put a pad or what you know or whatever some drum mm -hmm. thing and it sounds, sounds pretty good but like if you strip it out there's not much music there sometimes yeah yeah that i makes find that sense. especially with action cues i live with mm -hmm. action music in that there's so many sounds that it's easy like if you if you start an action cue with percussion i think that it's so easy to just get lulled into thinking it's good because the yeah. percussion's not badass and it's like oh we got this cool dun, 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 yeah. You know? yeah but if you take that out then the music is like sounds like a three-year-old sitting at a piano yeah, you know just... what i mean so like i like to try to write action stuff without the drums first you know to try to give it some yeah. kind of internal motor because I find if you get the music working without the percussion then the percussion just helps but if yeah, if, it, yeah. if it sucks without the percussion then maybe you want to mute it and yeah. get something going before that's so. an interesting approach to action sequences because i would always think at least previously in the stuff that i've worked on like an action sequence comes up i'm like great i'll throw some drums in put some stuff on top of it but yeah 
being able to isolate the music first probably completely changes the way that that sequence could feel. That's interesting. I, that for me, yeah, for me it does. It, mm -hmm. Yeah, because you know, if you can get some internal motion from the orchestra, or you know, I mean, then the battle's half won. You know, yeah. and sometimes it's just simple stuff. It's just kind of basses going boom, boom, boom. Maybe if they're going boom, 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 boom. You know what I mean? You get a little yeah. motion, and then all that stuff kind of pulls each other along mm -hmm. without the percussion. So yeah, I, I like to do. It. Um, nice because again it's just too easy so yeah yeah that makes sense um what was one of the biggest challenges that you faced during this whole writing process biggest challenge was time mm. <laughs> because there was not a lot of time so like i came in i think november 1st and uh, yeah. the first orchestra session was December 27th, wow. which was basically two and a half movies in like six, six weeks. Jeez. Uh, so that was, yeah. And I don't have ghost writers. I literally write every cue myself. Yeah, almost. yeah. So that was, that was daunting. That's insane. I yeah. just remember looking at it. And the first dub was January 3rd, and then the dubs were two days after each other. So 101 was January 3rd, then January 5th, and January 7th. Was, so it was like just a mountain of like when it got to Christmas it was like holy crap like you know because there's like 25 cues an episode so there's like you're looking at 130 cues and different forms of being signed off and approved yeah. and being orchestrated and being recorded like mm -hmm. it was a lot so once we got that first one recorded and then you can start like okay one of five is off the plate that, you know yeah it got much easier but just Breathe just the bit. sheer volume of it all was that was the hardest thing. Yeah, yeah. Because a lot sense. of times, like, it, it, the soonest I've ever seen anything with dub another episode would be a week later. Like, to have mm. it two days later is just, yeah. like, they had two crews going, and it was, that was terrifying. And just yeah, knowing there's that many people relying on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm pretty, I pride myself on being pretty fast and pretty detail-oriented, but, like, I literally said to the post-producer when I got this thing, I was like, I literally don't know if that's humanly possible, you know, <laughs> Yeah, do that, you know, so that was, that was the biggest challenge for mm -hmm. sure, mm -hmm. you know. Um, with that, do you find it challenging to, within a very short amount of time, kind of be creatively satisfied with the music that you write? Uh, no, not, not really, because I feel like, I feel like if you get your building blocks in the beginning then mm -hmm. the writing becomes easy you know yeah, it, yeah. It becomes, and I, I i find that I, just for me like probably the first second idea or something is most times the best you know like mm -hmm. if you're on version 15 or something it's usually getting worse and worse every time you're doing it <laughs> I, I think so i i think many and a lot of times when you go down the rabbit hole on something like that, where it's like, they, you know, they just won't approve it for some reason and then they're, they're just want something else. If you go back and play version one, a lot of times that gets you way closer to where you end up. Mm -hmm. And that, it's yeah. happened so many times, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a conversation and it's a collaboration and a process. And sometimes you have to try all these other things to get back to what you thought was the best. You know, sometimes they just like it right off the bat or sometimes you like, but yeah. But yeah, I mean, sure, you can always like detail stuff like, but I find the general concept of, of what you do early on is, is usually better. Nice. So. Has there been a lot of examples either in this or your previous work where you've done so many, so many iterations and then figured out something completely different? Uh, rare. Interesting, I, you know, okay. I can't think of something specific, but usually, yeah, I can't think of one where I'm like, God, version 22 was so much better than version two. Because <laughs> usually, because I think you, you know, you only have so many different ways you can approach something. You know yeah. what I mean? And like, yeah. at a certain point, you just don't know what the hell you're bringing to this scene anymore. You know, mm -hmm. and you're just, yeah. dying. It, so that gets hard. Yeah. yeah. I think I just had something like this recently. I'm trying to think where I just finished, but. Um, Oh, I'm, hold on, I'm drawing a blank. But it's like, I, oh yeah, I just finished a movie, uh, Amazon movie, and oh nice, 
there were two cues in the beginning. I, the whole thing was approved, but the first two cues, which were like throwaways to me, uh, but they just were not buying what I was selling. And, and it was interesting because um, it's a movie that uh, a woman gets cancer. So, uh, but it doesn't happen until like more than halfway through. So it's mm -hmm. like, it's like two different movies. Once the person get you know, once it turns and someone gets cancer and there's all this emotional stuff, it's mm -hmm. way different from the first half of the movie. So they were really worried about it feeling like two different movies, but they also didn't want the cues in the beginning to signify that anything bad was going to happen. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So I really struggled on that. I'm like, look, well, and they were in like bars a lot of times too. So there's mm -hmm. a, like a lot of source music. There's not yeah. that much score early on, but so I was like, look, if you just, if you just have these two or three cues, they're kind of on an island by themselves before. And if they don't, if you don't tie them to stuff later, then it just seems like they're meaningless. You know, they're just like mm -hmm. songs. And so I just couldn't, I couldn't get them. And actually I think it was like version 18 on the, the first one was the one like yeah. it was something I literally just was like I'm just going to try the first thing that comes to my head like it was, yeah. and that's what they like so so sometimes it does but rare rarely yeah. do you get better as it goes I find interesting nice um kind of switching gears a little bit I wanted to ask you about your own personal musical background and see how that tied into the score for White House a lot of jazz a lot of like 70s period piece stuff. Did right. you find any of your musical background being advantageous while writing that? No. Interesting. <laughs> not, at not at all. No, I mean, I think as composers, we uh, we kind of fake our way through a lot of stuff sometimes. You know? <laughs> I mean, I knew in my head from listening to that stuff through my life, you know, and I knew I I, I love Lala Schifrin and I, I like a lot of that stuff. I just didn't yeah. ever scored something exactly like that. Mm. um yeah I, I i studied piano for a long time as a kid but then I, I was a rock guy i played drums and guitar so nice jazz was surely not my forte mm -hmm. and so but it's funny i've done a few things the last few years i did this show called the kaminsky method that was pretty jazzy and uh i just did this smartless documentary that was pretty jazzy and i'm i've had some people like reach out they're like oh you're like a jazz cat and i'm like no, I don't know. Like <laughs> but I don't know. I think we just kind of, I don't know. We're just improvising. You know, that's what jazz yeah, is. It's yeah. just improvising, right? It's like mm -hmm. you're, only, you're only half step away from being right. You know what I mean? Yeah, so you yeah. You just got to sell it, you know? And, you know, some of that chordal stuff, it's really just, for me, it's just sitting at the piano until something sounds good. And then, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. sometimes I won't even know what I just played, but it, that's okay. If it sounds right, it is right. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm not the guy who sit there and be like, oh, that was augmented 13th into the <laughs> flat. You know, like, I, I was just, just, just like, I, you know, I. there's guys who are really good at that. And it's mm -hmm. funny, some guys who talk like that, I find aren't the best creators, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. Just, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's, so there's a difference. Um, but yeah, sometimes I think your ignorance leads to interesting mistakes yeah absolutely know? i mean i've got a lot of people who i will write something and then i'll ask them for feedback and then they'll, they'll say like oh there's like this going on here this going on here and i was like i didn't even think about any of that i was just this sounding good <laughs> yeah you know and yeah, they'll sit down I, and try I, to write something for the same thing and it'll be like not as not as communicative because they're focused on the theory rather than the actual feeling of it you know yeah Totally, because that it, it doesn't matter if, if it sounds right. I mean, every time I do a string session, I will get stopped on one or two cues where they're like, you know, bar three, there's an A flat against an A. You know, I'm like, yeah, that's right. Just let's do it. <laughs> you know, like I yeah. always, I like the like rubs that they'll look at and say that's wrong because it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. You know, and like, but I love that stuff. Like, yeah. I, yeah. I love when you just hit a bad note for two beats that goes to the right play, like it's yeah. just, that's one of the interesting stuff. And, you know, again, a lot of it for me is out of ignorance or just out of me just jamming, but like, mm -hmm. I think that's okay. Yeah. You know? It's okay. Cause if it, other, otherwise it's all the white keys, you know, it's all the, the then it's just, it gets boring. Mm -hmm. And then we all sound the same, you know? So I think everyone's little idiosyncrasies is what makes yeah. it interesting stuff sometimes you know yeah i had just talked to um 
Josue Greco, who had scored the new Welcome to Wrexham show. Yeah. And one of the things he said was, like, everyone's so focused on trying to make everything sound perfect. And one of the things that he really found interesting in his score was making things sound bad on purpose. Because if everything sounds bad, then it all sounds good, you know? No, it's really interesting you say that, or he says that, because I'm the same way. I'm not like a, I'm not a gearhead. I'm not a computer mm -hmm. guy. I'm not like, I don't have the latest sample libraries. Like, I kind of hate all that stuff because it just makes it sound the same and too perfect. Yeah. So I, I use a lot of acoustic instruments and, you know, I could play some better than others, but I find the imperfections are what gives music life and what yeah. gives it your personality, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, like, yeah, I have my piano. I, I use this upright with the with the practice pedal on because it gives it gives puts the felt on, and it sounds yeah. it sounds awesome, but it sounds noisy and clunky. And my mix yeah. hates it because it always sounds. And <laughs> but like, yeah, or my drums, it's like, you know, my drums sound like crap, but like mm -hmm. that's good, you know. And like, it doesn't sound like Stephen Slate. No offense to Stephen yeah. Slate, but it doesn't sound perfect, you know. Like those, yeah. some of the samples sound pristine and it's like so i like yeah and i use like i had a uh i had an auto harp that i used on the score a bunch and I, it's it's sitting there it hasn't been tuned in like 10 years i mean it just sounds <laughs> off yeah but i just put it up and would be plucking it with a ton of reverb mm -hmm. like these out of tune notes and like when the notes like semitones off like put against other things it sounds interesting you know yeah so, yeah yeah a lot of things like that it's like use what you have mm -hmm. to 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 be you yeah and i think there's that's oh sorry everything else yeah right. yeah um i was just gonna say i think that's at least to me one of the reasons why the score for white house sounds like similar but also different from all that like 70s stuff is because of that embrace of imperfection and things not sounding good to make your own sound you know yeah and, I, you know, I think it takes a while for us all to find that or to, to be confident enough to. Yeah. Because in the beginning, you just want to get a job. You just yeah. want, <laughs> want to figure out what the hell you have to do to mm -hmm. get to where you're trying to go, you know. Yeah. And so it it's, you know, I got a lot of miles on me at this point. So yeah. it's like at a certain point, you want to do stuff that you feel inside that 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 resonates with you, you know, because if you're making music that you don't care about, then. I don't think anyone else is going to care about it. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah, I think for me, it's, you know, playing stuff myself and hearing it with, with other stuff, you know, and, yeah, uh, and playing real instruments and hearing that I've got this boat guitar I use a bunch and it just sounds bad sometimes, but it's the bad with the good makes it interesting. Yeah. You know, but, mm -hmm. but, but again, it takes a while to come up with, to have enough confidence to like try that stuff. Yeah. Not that yeah. Because, Absolutely. Yeah, it's hard. Great. Well, I think that's great advice to any like young composer, young person trying to get into this whole industry. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. I am going to completely change gears here. Um, yeah. just because I had this question has always interested me as well as Sapphire. Um, there's the ongoing WGA strike with a lot of the writers at Netflix, HBO, all of these major film companies. How do you feel about composers as technical writers being kind of figures of solidarity with like film and television writers? Yeah, that's that's tough because we've mm -hmm. never been able to be a part of any. any yeah, yeah. Been, so there have been many times they've tried to start a composers union and, and mm -hmm. just it's, for whatever reason, it hasn't worked. You know, I mean. Obviously, we support the writers, we support the directors, we support yeah. the actors, and we're all kind of in this together. So yeah, we're kind of we're kind of in this weird spot where we're on the sidelines for all of this. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, we can go out on the lines of march with people and support them, but we're I don't know what we can do to to help other than Interesting, offer yeah. our words of encouragement and our support. Yeah. And yeah. you know. Um, it's the issue and you look the, the issues that affect them affect us too in, in yeah, a different yeah. Way, you know i mean all the residuals and all that stuff is it, it it's affecting us the same way mm -hmm. um 
so I don't know how we fight our battle in that as composers, you know, and it's mm -hmm. weird because as musicians have a union, but composers don't have a union, which defies yeah. all logic. I don't <laughs> understand this. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's weird, but it, I, you look, I, th I think it's a battle that needs to be fought now. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there is, I, you know, just flip side of the argument, you know, because the, you know, the streamers and everyone do get a lot of mm -hmm. shit these days, you know, I mean, everyone, yeah. they, they, they're an easy target, uh, you know, and for composers as well. But, but if you step back, uh, one bright side of this is that, you know, when I got into this, there was studio film, TV, you know, network, cable was, you know, and then independent film or straight yeah. to DVD, you know, and, and the, the delineations were pretty stark. You know, if you were a TV guy, you were not doing films or, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It, it, and, but now streaming, there, there's, I mean, as an aspiring composer, there's way more opportunities for you, for any of us than there was 10 years ago. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, way more. And, you know, it's got its problems. It's got its growing pains for sure. Mm -hmm. But there, there are some positives. There's, there's way more opportunity. There's mm -hmm. way more cross you know i mean you'll see a guy that did a gigantic movie that's doing a streaming tv show like you know what yeah, i mean like you're yeah. everyone fighting against everyone for everything like there's mm -hmm. no but then you'll see some person you've never heard of before get this big like because anything goes and i, yeah, I feel like yeah. because of you know, you know there's all other cultural things going on so people yeah. take a chance on people for all kinds of reasons so i mean you can come out of nowhere and bypass everyone and get the yeah. biggest thing out there. And so that's great. And that yeah, didn't yeah. exist, I don't think, years ago. Yeah. And, uh, you know, also, if you're lucky enough to do a movie or a TV show, you know, um, residual-wise, now there's many more outlets where that same thing can make residuals. Where yeah. Before, you did network, it might go to cable when it went to syndication. So then there, it would live on a little, but now everything mm -hmm. kind of lives along, lives on for a long time and in four mm -hmm. different places, you know? So yeah. there are some positives. I mean, I, I acknowledge all the negatives. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it's not all bad. And I, I think yeah. some of the negatives will, you know, there, there's, a, for, for what we do, there's a lot of like, talk about the, about the royalties on streaming. As, yeah, as yeah. You know, and, which is true, but it's not necessarily an apples to apples comparison either, because, mm -hmm. you know, it, for royalties, it, when you got something on TV, it really didn't depend what the ratings were. You know, if yeah. you had something on ABC, you got to pay the same if it got 20 million viewers or if it got one. It didn't matter, like being there or, you know, same with cable. It was yeah, if you yeah. were in a certain channel at a certain time, you got paid the same amount of money. Now, with streaming, there's no hiding behind that anymore. Mm -hmm. If you're showing it, it gets way more plays, but if yeah. it's not, you don't get as much as a thing. So while it's more fair because of that, a lot of people don't like the fairness, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's fair. So, and, you know, streaming, the, the window of your popularity is way shorter. You know, if you mm -hmm. have a hit on Netflix, that might be a hit for a, for a month or two months. Yeah, you know? but yeah. The next one. So they don't stick <laughs> around. As long. So there, there's a lot of changes, you know, yeah. not uh, not all good and you know at the same thing the writers and directors and everyone else are, are trying to negotiate um, yeah yeah there's still I, like things to iron out in that whole system it seems yeah but i think that i think it's gonna get settled I, you <laughs> know I, I can't imagine a world where the studios just say no we're not doing anything you want you know yeah I mean, yeah they're gonna have to meet them somewhere it's just <laughs> it's like the republicans and the democrats with the stupid you know debt limit thing you know <laughs> like Sounds like nothing's going to happen. And then everyone caves and you kind of meet in the middle. Yeah, yeah. After a certain amount of time. That's how it, that's how it has to go. So I, 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 I have no doubt that when it settles, a lot of people will be relieved. It'll mm -hmm. probably not get everything everyone wants to, but I'm sure it'll get a lot closer to where yeah. they are. And that's progress, you know? Yeah. And that, it's like every time it comes around, just little by little making making those deals and making those compromises until it gets to a point where most people yeah. are happy. Yeah. But with that being said, I do feel like they do need to dig in now because like there have been things in the past where like yeah. theaters, ASCAP, you know, we don't get royalties in theaters because we gave yeah. up that fight and 
Uh, same thing with like DVDs, like you mm-hmm. know, no residuals on DVDs. Like, so those fights, once you lose them, you never get to fight. Yeah, again. they're lost. So, yeah. You know, if the writers don't make progress on these things now, they'll never yeah, absolutely. get later. So I understand how yeah. imperative it is to, to fight the good fight. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, on that note, we are slightly out of time. Um, to bring it back to our original conversation, though, um, if you want to tell people where they can listen to the score for White House, where they can watch the show, if you have any other uh, music or stuff that you want to plug, feel free to do it right now. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I'm just going to plug White House Palmer's <laughs> so please nice. watch it. It's, it's all out now on HBO Max. Uh, the soundtrack is on everywhere else. and. Uh, Apple, Apple, Spotify, everywhere. And if you're an Academy voter, I am competing in the uh, best limited series category. And I love you. Nice. Awesome. That's super cool. Congratulations about that, by the way. Well, (laughs) it's nothing yet, but yeah, I, you know, I, I don't really play these games on the Emmy competition stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, because there's a lot of content out there and I I don't really submit or campaign unless something is worth it. But I I really do feel like this is a special one and it's worth it. Nice. Awesome. That's great news. Um, With that. Yeah. Thank you for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you everyone for watching and tuning in. Uh, Feel free to look at the page and look at the accounts for some more episodes if you're interested. Thank you. Thanks. Nice to meet you. Of course. Nice to meet you as well.